Hey guys, Pat Kelly here. I'm a guide and the fly manager at Mad River Outfitters. Welcome to another fly tying tutorial. Thanks for joining us. Today we're going to be doing a uh, hollow fly. As anybody that knows me probably knows that the hollow fly is my favorite fly of all times. It was a, a technique, the hollow tying technique was pioneered by Bob Popovics. Um, a lot of the uh, you know basic techniques used in hollow tying are found in flies that are very, very common today. This is a similar fly to what we're going to be doing today. It's just a basic hollow fly. Um, this is a small mouth version that we use a lot around here in our guiding and fishing locally. Um, works on small mouth anywhere you fish in the country. Um, other patterns that use the hollow tying technique, uh, which a lot of people are going to be familiar with nowadays, are the musky flies and predator flies. Um, a lot of the pike and musky style flies exclusively use hollow tying techniques. Uh, the hollow tying technique, is, which we'll get into today, um, is just a way of working with bucktail. And the whole idea behind hollow tying is it allows you to um, create the illusion of bulk without actually having a lot of mass in the fly. So you take a fly like this, for example, which looks really, really large and heavy, but it's actually incredibly sparse. And a lot of that is due to the hollow tying uh, technique. So it gives you, again, just the illusion of bulk without actually not being uh, incredibly bulky. So hollow flies are really, really easy to cast. Uh, a lot of fun to fish. In my opinion, there's nothing that looks better in the water than a hollow fly. Uh, that just all the fibers just kind of come to life. Even when a, a hollow fly is at rest in the water, when you're not moving it, every individual bucktail fiber is just quivering and fluttering and it just looks incredible. Um, anybody that's ever fished with me or gone on a guide trip with me can tell you that I don't have anything really else in my box except for hollow flies. I just love fishing them. I love tying them. So um, uh, I'm excited to get to show you how to tie one. Very, very easy to do. There's not a whole lot to it. Um, not a lot of fancy materials. It really just consists of some bucktail, a little bit of flash, uh, a good hook. Um, you know, eyes optional. You know, I, I tend to typically not put eyes on my flies, you know, my guide flies or my working flies. I'm generally not going to waste the time to, to put them on there, but, uh, you know, if it gives you more confidence in the fly to, to have eyes on there, certainly feel free to do so. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that at the end of the video as far as different options uh, for finishing the fly, but uh, let's go ahead and just jump right into it. The hook that I'm using today is kind of my go to uh, smallmouth bass hook. It's a hook from Partridge. It is the uh, Predator. The size is 2 watt. Um, I find myself kind of landing on that size, uh, you know, more than anything else. Just, it's just a really good, I like to have plenty of hook gap. Um, it also allows the fly to keel properly. Uh, that's, that's another important aspect of, of using a little bit larger hook is when you're tying larger flies, um, you want to make sure you're using a hook that can keel the fly properly so it tracks right in the water. Uh, the other thing that it does is, um, you know, it's going to allow you to land a lot more fish. I think I see too many flies that are tied with uh, with a hook that's not large enough, um, which is just making things more difficult for you to to get a good hook set and to land the fish. So let's just jump into it. Uh, the thread that I like to use typically on almost all my flies is going to be a uh, 100 denier gel spun uh, thread. I've just kind of settled upon that as, as kind of my favorite kind of working thread. Uh, I use it for many things from smallmouth flies to peacock flies, uh, pike, musky. It's just a really, really good all around thread for working with bucktail. I like it. Uh, the 100 denier is not real bulky, so it doesn't build up, uh, you know, too quickly. And it's just a really, really strong too, which is nice. So it allows you to, to tie a good durable fly. Um, it's going to hold up a long time. This fly, for example, has probably caught just this year you wouldn't tell by looking at it, but this thing's probably landed over 100 smallmouth this year, and it just looks brand new still. So um, bucktail is also, it's incredibly durable, which is nice, and it's very readily available. It's easy to get. Um, one thing that I like to do on all flies, whether I'm tying a peacock fly, a pike fly, a musky fly, a smallmouth fly, is I'm always going to lay a foundation of thread all along the hook shank. Uh, what that does is by covering up the, the hook shank with thread is it's going to give your materials a little bit of traction 
on the hook shank so that they're not sliding around on you. So just side by side wraps pretty much from right behind the eye all the way back to just above the uh, barb of the hook which is where our first tying point is going to be and where everything kind of starts. Um, bring that back to just above the barb, kind of cut your tag. First stage of this fly is going to be the tail, which is uh, bucktail. Uh, the pattern we're doing today is the sexy shad. That's kind of the color scheme. Uh, it's going to be more or less an all white body with a uh, fluorescent yellow and fluorescent blue head. Um, this is probably probably my top producing color. I would say it certainly was this year. The majority of my big fish came on this color, so that's the one I'm going to do for you today. Now the tail section of this fly is actually not uh, tied in hollow style, so we're just going to tie the tail in straight just right off the back like you would in, in a lot of other fly patterns. Um, I don't like to hollow tie the first section just because I'm trying to maximize the length of the tail, and by hollow tying it you tend to lose a little bit of length um, of your bucktail, so that there's really no need for it. Uh, tying it in straight like this too also uh, does uh, serves another purpose. It acts as a support for your flashaboo that you're going to be tying in so that it doesn't foul and get wrapped around the hook when you're casting and fishing the fly. So when you're going to select your material for the tail, typically speaking, uh, you know, your longest, you know, on all on most bucktails, your, your longest hair is generally going to be kind of in this, uh, you know, lower third of the bucktail generally. Now there are exceptions to that, but so when you go through and you pick up your tail and you're looking at, you know, trying to identify where the longest hair is, try to grab that for your tail. You know, that's, that's really, really important. So just kind of take a good look over at the tail, try to find the longest possible. Uh, all right, so once you've found the longest fibers on your bucktail, go ahead and just pull a little bit back off the hide. Um, I like to just kind of rest my bucktail down here on the table so I can get a good clean cut and cut as close to the hide as you can. That way, again, you're just maximizing the length of the fibers. Go ahead and just kind of clip those out. Set your tail to the side. Uh, one thing I do like to do before uh, I tie this tail in is I will uh, I'll kind of get in here and capture the fibers towards the top of the, uh, the tips of the bucktail. Just trap those between your thumb and your forefinger, and I'll take a comb, your fingers, and basically just try to preen out the shorter fibers. You just want to get those out of the way. They're not really going to do anything for you at this stage of the fly. Um, and again, just a couple times with the brush is all you really need. Just pull out those shortest fibers. Uh, once you've done that, just kind of gather all the uh, bucktail here down at the base. Make a good clean cut with your scissors. And just go ahead and hold that directly on top of the hook shank. Now when I tie this in, uh, I don't want any of the bucktail to spin. We're not trying to distribute anything around the hook yet. We're just doing a just a basic tie on top of the hook shank, keeping everything, uh, you know, if you can imagine the hook, you know, broken in half this way. We want all of the hair to be on the top of the, uh, of the hook shank just for this uh, particular stage. So. Again, tying point just above the barb there, which is more or less right where the shank starts on this particular hook. Hold everything up there, get in there with one kind of pinch wrap, trap those fibers with the thread with a loose wrap. Go ahead and make another couple, two or three wraps. Again, just kind of loose. Now, when you go to tighten this down, just make sure you're holding pretty firmly with your thumb and forefinger so that when you go to tighten your thread down to lock everything in place, if you're not holding those fibers down nice and tight, the tension and the torque from the thread will actually cause the hair to to want to spin around the hook shank too. To eliminate that happening, just kind of hold on to them real tight until you get everything kind of secured. Uh, now, I, what I like to do is I'll kind of just take side by side wraps up just a little bit, just to cover up all the butts there. Just give myself a good clean tying point. That's going to be the base at which we uh, tie the flash onto. So by covering up all those butts, just gives us a nice neat tying point so we can get that flash boo in there. Uh, one thing you'll notice too, notice there's really not that much hair here. Um, if you think you have the right amount of bucktail, cut the amount that you have in your hand in half, and that's probably getting closer to what you actually need. So uh, just always keep it really, really sparse. By keeping it sparse, again, you know, it's going to be easy to cast. It's going to breathe and move a lot better in the water, especially in the rear portion of the fly. Now as we go closer to the eye, we're going to kind of increase the amount of bucktail we use a little bit at a time. That way we can have a denser head. Uh, which will allow the fly to push and deflect water, which is 
you know, what causes this fly to swim, but we'll talk about that more as we get up there. So again, make sure that's all tightened down. At this point, if you want to put a little glue in there, you can. Um, I've gotten in the habit of using a lot of brushable super glues, just doing a lot of pike and musky fishing, you know, fish that have teeth, just a little bit of super glue to reinforce your tying point can kind of go a long way. And, um, you know, if you're going to spend the time tying a fly, you might as well tie it so that it lasts. So especially as a guide, if I only got a couple of flies or a couple of fish rather out of each fly, I'd be spending a lot of time at the vise when I get home. It's the last thing I want to be doing is tying flies. You know, I got plenty of other stuff to do. I got gear to prep and whatnot. So a little bit of super glue. I like to use the, uh, there's a product called Z-Mint from, uh, from Wopsy. It's a brushable super glue. It's very similar to the brushable Zapagap. The only difference between this Z-Mint and the brushable Zapagap is that's going to be a slightly thinner viscosity. I tend to favor that one just because it gives me good penetration down into the thread wraps and into the material to lock everything in. Uh, if you have just regular brushable Zapagap, that's certainly fine too. Uh, either one will work well. Now, for the flash, I tend to like to use the, for my first installment here, I'll use the Mirage Flash Boo in the tail here. You can kind of use really any Flash Boo that you have. I tend to like this Mirage in the, in the lateral scale. I use a lot of this stuff. It just has a really nice fishy look to it in the water. Now in your tail section, you can be pretty, pretty liberal with the amount of flash that you have here. Um, I think it kind of does two things for us. Um, by using a, a decent amount of flash, when it hangs off the back, which we'll see here in a little bit, that flashaboo kind of acts as a paddle and it gives the fly a lot of kick and, and motion in the water. So not only is it, is it uh, you know, giving me a little bit of flash and attraction to the fly, but it's also serving, you know, the purpose, purpose of uh, kind of kicking the fly and, and kind of acting like a paddle almost or a tail. Uh, so when I tie my flashaboo, what I like to do is I like to kind of tie it in reverse first. So what I'll do is I'll just take the butts here. It's just a little bit too much, I think. So I like to tie it in reverse rather than just tying it on top like this. What happens is a lot of times just by doing it this way, those fibers can get pulled out rather easily. So to eliminate that issue, if you take the fibers and tie them in backwards like this, trap them again, just right, sit them right on top of the hook shank, a couple of loose wraps just to trap your fibers. And then you can kind of get in there, tighten it down, and then take your thread back to your original tying point, which is again, just above the barb there. Once you've got that secured, you can fold this flashaboo backwards like this. And by folding it back over itself and locking it in again, it is going to be practically impossible to pull these flashaboo fibers out of the fly. This flashaboo will actually break well before those ever get pulled out. So again, just making the fly, doing little things that, that, that will make the fly a lot more durable and last a lot longer. So once that's tied in there, uh, as far as length, I typically like to cut my flashaboo just a little beyond where the bucktail ends. So I'll maybe go about, I don't know, half an inch maybe, just so it sticks out a little bit farther. I tend to like going a little bit past the bucktail, but when that fly is swimming through the water with that flash boo hanging back there, it kind of gives a little bit of a transparency or translucency to the fly. You know, if you look at a bait fish swimming through the water, if you look at its tail, you know, a lot of the shiners and shad have kind of a transparency to their, to their tail fin. So um, by doing, it just kind of gives you a, a way to imitate that a little bit. Once that's tied in, you can go ahead and just advance your thread up the hook shank here. We're probably going to go up about, I'd say about a quarter of the way up the hook shank. Okay, so at this point, this is where we're going to begin hollow tying. Um, and from here on out, it'll be hollow tying the rest of the way up. Uh, one important note uh, that I'd like to mention with you guys, when you're, anytime you're hollow tying or tying a hollow fly, um, it's important that you always have to have a minimum of three sections. You can't really create taper without three sections. So each hollow tie, you know, moving forward is going to be slightly shorter than the last one. And the idea behind that is, again, you're building taper in the fly. You're also trying to expose um, as many of the tips in the bucktail as you can. 
So bring your thread about a quarter of the way up the hook shank. Your first tie, again, really, really sparse. Don't overdo it. It's very, very easy for, uh, if you're kind of new to hollow tying, to, to use too much hair here. I'll try to do a good job of holding up how little I'm actually using up to the camera here after I cut this off and show you that. And this first hollow tie too, it'll also have less material. There'll be, there'll be less in this piece than there is in any other piece. Cause again, as you move forward, you're going to increase the amount of hair that you use just a little bit at a time. Um, so if you look at that, there's hardly any hair there. I mean, I'm not going to do anything crazy and, and try to count those, but I'd say there probably can't be any more than about, I don't know, 30. But some people use pencil whisks. I mean, that's, that's maybe about if probably a quarter of a pencil. So very, very little hair. Now, one thing that I like to do before I actually tie this in, we need to measure and use our tail as kind of a reference. So if you can try to find out exactly where the bucktail ends on the tail, and you're going to want this first hollow tie to kind of come back about three quarters of the way into that last or previous section. So just kind of take your hands, hold it up there on top of the hook shank. You know, our bucktail's ending right about here. Tips are here, so that's about 75 or 80 percent of the length of this tail section here. Once you kind of got that measured, just kind of take a mental note of where you're holding that uh, that bucktail there, and that's where you're going to cut it. You know, I like to cut everything to length before I tie it in. That way, I know it ends up being you know, exactly this long when we fold it backwards. So once you get that measured here, get in here. Again, just cut your butts nice and clean. Give yourself a really neat tie-in point. So just like the flashaboo, we're going to take the bucktail, lay it right on top of the hook shank with the tips facing out this way. I'm going to do a couple of loose wraps. I'll do one, two, three. And then before we tighten anything down, this is really, really important. What we're going to do is we're going to take our thumb and our forefinger and we're going to distribute all that hair evenly, 360 degrees around the shank of the hook. Okay. That way when we fold this back, we'll have a nice even spread of hair. You know, if you look at this fly here, if you're looking kind of down the front of it, if you look, it's kind of symmetrical all the way around, you know, so kind of imagine that silhouette as you're spreading this hair around the hook. So just kind of take your thumb and your forefinger, kind of pinch it top and bottom, side to side. Once you think you've got it pretty well evenly spread, you can go ahead and just cinch down on your thread. Tighten everything, get it locked down to the hook shank. Now the nice thing about this, if you don't get everything perfect, don't worry about it. You can always back your thread off, uh, you know, redistribute your fibers. If, if it looks a little bit uneven, you know, kind of take a peek if everything looks good, then we'll then just kind of run with it. But if you look down your fly and if you notice, hey, man, I got way too many fibers on top there, it's not a big deal. You just back off your thread, spread it around a little bit, get it to where you want it. Nothing's permanent at this point, so it's an easy fix. But if you like the way it looks, go ahead and just tighten up your thread. And again, I'll typically wrap all the way back to cover up all my butts. Yeah, just to give me a nice clean, clean looking fly here. So once you cover up those butts, I like to bring my thread all the way back to just behind my bucktail here because we're going to have to we're going to have to pull the thread forward uh, once we fold this hair back. I think one important thing to mention too: a lot of people um, that are kind of getting into this, I think they get a little bit confused between the hollow tying and reverse tying. Uh, there's actually is a difference. Reverse tying is um, when you everything starts out the same. You know, you start with your material pointing out towards the front of the fly. You tie it in backwards. You're going to fold it. I'll give you kind of a quick example. You know, reverse tying is going to be when you fold the material back and actually trap the material with thread wraps on top of it like that. Hollow tying is actually building up and holding the materials back with thread wraps that are in front of the material and not on top of the material. Um, you know, the Thunder Creek Minnow, that's probably one of the oldest streamers out there, that uses reverse tying. 
uh, and that's a situation where, or a pattern in which the, the material is being held down by thread wraps that are on top of the bucktail. But with this technique, we're going to be holding the material back with a thread dam, what's called a thread dam. So you're essentially building a wall of thread in front of this bucktail to prop it backwards. Um, so what I like to do, I just grabbed an empty pen casing that makes a great push tool that just kind of allows you to push everything back out of the way. Get your material hand there, hold everything, and then when you bring your thread forward, I like to pull my thread out and kind of parallel to the hook shank and then kind of bring it up, making sure you don't trap any fibers as you come forward, and then just start building a cone in front of this bucktail. You can just imagine you're essentially building a wall of thread to hold this all of this bucktail back. Now one thing you want to mention I want to mention too when you're doing this, as you're progressing up the hook shank, you're trying to build taper in the fly. So when you fold this first section back, if you can picture a bait fish in your head, it gradually gets bigger as it goes forward. So you got to be thinking about kind of the angle of your bucktail as you're working your way up through the pattern here. Um, if you look at it, this first hollow tie, you're going to be wanting to lay relatively flat, you know, and then as we work up, our angle of our bucktail is going to kind of increase and get a little bit taller as we move forward. The way to control that is the size of your thread dam. So the bigger your cone or the bigger your thread dam is, the more flat your bucktail is going to lay, you know, backwards. You know, the smaller the thread dam, the less it's going to hold the bucktail down. The, the taller the bucktail is going to stand forward. So you'll kind of see that as we complete the fly and kind of move along here. But um, once you get the bucktail kind of laid back pretty flat and you're happy with it, you can kind of just move forward. We'll go into our next tie and we're going to just do the exact same thing that we just did. Uh, again, the only thing to keep in mind is uh, when you go in and tie in your next section, just remember that your next hollow tie needs to be about, again, 75% of what your previous uh, previous piece of bucktail. That way, as you're moving forward, your, your, each chunk of bucktail or each tie of bucktail is going to be a little bit shorter than the last one. All right, so now we're ready for our third hollow tie. Kind of pull everything back. I'll get my hair clip. Clip everything together like that. So if I'm looking at this point of the fly here, I have my tail. Our first hollow tie, you know, our tail fibers end here, you know, just to kind of give you guys a visual because you might not be able to see this, but the tail fibers, the bucktail ends here. Our first hollow tie, the tips are ending right about here. Uh, our last hollow tie that we just did, our tips are ending right about here. So you can kind of start to visualize you know how each section is a little bit shorter as we're moving forward. Always keeping that in mind. Every time uh, at all stages of the fly you constantly need to be thinking about taper and shape of the fly. So we're just going to repeat the last step. All right. If you look at our bucktail, our angle of our bucktail is constantly getting a little bit steeper here as we work our way forward. I'm going to start moving through this pretty quickly just so, since we're repeating everything that we've done in the past uh, or in the last three sections here. Uh, at this point I'm going to switch from white bucktail. I'm going to move to yellow. Uh, the whole sexy shad color kind of originated in the uh, the conventional world. A lot of the uh, you know jerk baits and, and plugs and uh, and hard baits that, that conventional fishermen would throw. I think it was Striking was the company. Um, it's, it's an all white with basically a chartreuse and a little bit of blue on it. And they kind of dubbed that Sexy Shad. So I just, that's where the name came from. Uh, it's a color scheme that smallmouth just really, really like. All right, guys, so we've made our way all the way up to uh, the hook shank here. We're coming close to the finish line here. We're about done. Um, all I've done is I've 
basically repeated everything that we've done previously in the video. We added a one cone of fluorescent yellow bucktail. We added one cone of the fluorescent blue just to kind of finish thing off, everything off. Uh, that is kind of those two colors combined kind of is what makes this fly the sexy shad color. Um, so there'll be a couple more things just to kind of finish this fly off real quick. This next step is kind of optional. Um, as with most uh, things fly tying and fly fishing or fishing in general, fishermen tend to want to overcomplicate things. This next step I don't think is going to uh, increase the amount of fish that this fly will catch, but it sure looks cool, so that's why I'm going to do it. Um, there's a, uh, a product from Hedron, the Grizzly Flashaboo. Love this stuff. It's relatively new. Um, I like it a lot just because it, if you look at it, it's, it's barred just like a saddle is. Uh, it just has a really, really fishy look to it. The neat thing about it is it's actually not reflective at all. It just kind of has a matte finish to it. Uh, it just kind of gives a little bit of depth and a little bit of contrast to the fly. Again, not that uh, I think it's going to matter a whole lot, but um, you know, having that grizzly pattern just to finish the fly off just right over the back is just going to add a little bit of depth and color up there. You know, if you look at it, any bait fish, any forage fish, you know, really any fish in general, it's always going to have a slightly darker coloration across the back. Um, so this is just kind of my take on that or my play on that. So I'll just come in here. Uh, you don't need a whole lot. Maybe do six or eight strands, which we're going to double this over. So six or eight strands will end up being 12 or 16. So again, we'll tie this flash the same way that we did every uh, installment of flash throughout the fly. Uh, what I like to do here just to make things a little bit easier and quicker is I will just take the flash and I'll just kind of wrap it around my thread and then kind of get a hold of it here. And then what I'll do is I'll just kind of work it right up to the top of the hook shank there, kind of fold it back out of the way. I'll just get in there and get a couple of wraps around the flash boot just to kind of trap it. Again, not locking anything in all the way just yet. Um, and then I'll just take my thumb and just kind of push those uh, flash boot fibers. Just kind of smash them just a little bit and that'll kind of help distribute everything right around the top half or across the shoulders of the fly here. Once you get it where you want it, you can go ahead and just kind of lock it in. And then as far as, uh, you know, trimming this fly, you can just kind of, or trimming the flash. If you want to trim it, you can. Um, when this fly gets wet and it's in the water, all those fibers will just kind of sit nice and neat on top of the back there, so I'm not going to worry about it. Last thing is you, eyes. Uh, I talked about it a little bit earlier in the video. You know, if you want to add eyes to your flies, you can. Um, if I'm tying a guide fly or a working fly, I'm not going to worry about it. It's just one less step. Uh, you know, a lot of flies that I'll tie for people, I'll, I'll include eyes just because they look cool. But as far as, you know, like my personal box, if you open up any of my boxes, you'll probably find flies on maybe 5% of, of my stuff. But um, now, quick thing about eyes. One thing that, uh, that I, if I am going to use an eye, I really like tab eyes. Um, there's a new product from uh, from ProTube that we will be carrying soon. Uh, it's a 3D tab eye, and what I mean by tab eye, if you look at it, it's more or less just a 3D eye with a kind of a sticker tab attached to it, uh, which is nice. That's what you'll use to tie the eye in. Uh, the reason why I like the tab eyes over, say, uh, you know, using the stick-on eyes, is you know you have this really really nice profile that you worked pretty hard to build. Okay. If you were to take just two 3D eyes, some super glue, and just smash them right on there, you're going to ruin that profile. It's going to take you know everything that you built and kind of worked and took your time with building all the way up. Might as well just throw it out the window. Uh, so those tab eyes are really nice because it allows you to to those tabs are just so uh, there's just not much to them. I'll kind of see if I can't peel one off and show it to you. You can attach these right up at the front of the fly here. You can see they're real, real thin, so I can tie these on up here like this. And then the eye just kind of floats back into the fly real kind of natural-like. I'll tie it in and I'll, I'll 
kind of show you guys, but uh, I guess what I'm getting at is if you are going to use eyes on these flies, buy the tab eyes. Um, that way you, you can keep that really nice profile to your fly. Now, depending on the overall length or size of your fly, uh, you may have to trim this tab, you know, a little bit shorter. You know, just kind of depending on where you want your eye. So just do your best to kind of gauge, uh, you know, what you think looks right. Just for the purposes of the video, I'm going to just leave it at the length it is instead of messing with it too much. So again, just kind of, you're going to hold the... Uh, I'm just basically placing the eye right up directly on the side of the hook shank and just kind of holding it in place. And I've just taken a thread wrap to kind of trap it and then you can tighten it down and, and get it secured in the rest of the way. You only really need a couple of wraps there. You don't want to build up too much uh, head on this fly here. Otherwise you'll end up with a big beak, uh, which is just drives me crazy. Something about the way that a big thread head looks just, I don't know, it makes me sick. So just try to, no more than a couple, two or three wraps. When we're all done with locking in that other eye, we're going to put a little bit of super glue on there too. So that's going to kind of help secure everything. Uh, now we're going to do the same thing just right on the other side here. If I can peel this thing off. There we go. And flip your fly around. Again, just lay that right up there. Kind of get it lined up to where you want it. Just kind of do one loose wrap just to kind of trap it. Hold it in place, look at it, make sure it's where you want it. And then you can kind of come in with, uh, you know, two or three more wraps and lock it in place there. Uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to finish the fly. Just going to do a basic, uh, you know, a whip finish or a half hitch. You know, either one works just fine. Uh, I'm going to just do a whip finish with my hand simply because I have never used one of the whip finish tools and don't really know how to use one. Um, I just learned to do it with my hands when I was a kid and just kind of stuck with it. Uh, one thing I like to do before I finish off the flies, I'll take this uh, brushable z mint and I will just put a little bit of it on my thread just like that. And that one when I go to whip finish I can get some super glue there on the inside of my thread wraps so it can soak down into those tabs too and, and also make sure that those get locked in place and they don't go anywhere. Uh, once you get that on there you can just cut that off. Now at this point if you want to finish it again um, with some of that Z-Mint you can. Um, a lot of times I'll finish it with some you know some UV, some Loon UV resin, which is really, really nice. Gives you a good, really solid, durable uh, thread head there that won't fall apart. Uh, using that UV resin too is really, really nice. It kind of adds uh, a nice, clean, clean look to the fly. It's also just indestructible too, which is nice. Um, one thing too, when I'm done with these flies, I just want to mention real quick, if you look at this fly right now, it's a little bit crazy looking. You know, you got fibers kind of flaring out all over the place. It's kind of hard to... Uh, to imagine this taking on any sort of bait fish sh shape at the moment. What I like to do after I tie my flies is I will uh, see if I can find a paper clip. What I'll do essentially is I just like to take my flies and I'll run them under some hot water and that'll kind of allow the materials to kind of take a set. So I'll just take a little paper clip, kind of thread it through the eye. And then what I like to do is, uh, you know, in my tying room, I just kind of have a string hanging up. So I'll just run that under some hot water for a couple of minutes, just hang it up to dry. When that fly dries, it will take on this kind of profile, which is nice. So guys, thanks for watching. That's the hollow fly. Uh, we will have more, uh, more more tutorials coming. I'll probably do um, a hollow fly or a hollow tying video for a pike fly, and then we also got one coming on a musky fly. Uh, similar principles, uh, same basic idea, but things just done a little bit differently. So, again, thanks for watching. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, and uh, we'll see you next time.